Okay, well, thank you, Brittany, for joining us. This is a follow-up right after our RAC meeting. My name is Sonia Bingaman with the State Council on Developmental Disabilities, and uh, many of the individuals here are our RAC members, and as well as many members of the community, and we welcome all of you. Um, each, uh, every other month when we have our RAC meeting, we try to follow it with a training that might be of interest to you. So today, Brittany Gillespie has offered to share about IHSS. Of course, we only have an hour, so we're gonna let her go ahead and do the training. Feel free to put any questions in the chat box. Kathy and I will be watching that. Um, but how do you feel, Brittany, about questions? Do you want them to come throughout or do you wanna wait a little bit and then pause for questions? It's up to you. Yeah, throughout the presentation is fine. There's a lot of material, and if anyone wants to focus in on something in particular, that's perfectly fine. And since it is being recorded, I would ask people to not share any personal information, just keep it general. And I'll, as I'm introducing, I'll give my contact information if you want to ask things more one on one if you have specific questions. Thank you. Okay, and then toward the end, a few minutes before the end, I will put up a poll and ask you to fill out the poll just about what you think about the training, and that'd be helpful for me if you can stay till, till the end so that you can fill out the poll questions. So I will turn it over to you, Brittany. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Sonia, and good afternoon now, everybody. My name is Brittany Gillespie, and I'm the attorney and client's rights advocate for Alta California Regional Center clients. Um, we provide uh, free legal and advocacy services to regional center clients with the Office of Client Rights Advocacy, um, or OCRA for short, and the Office of Client Rights Advocacy is one of uh, several units within Disability Rights California. All of, all of the units provide free legal and advocacy assistance to people with disabilities which can range uh, from just giving information and advice and resources over the phone, um, helping you understand what your rights are. We can go to IEP meetings, IEP meetings, regional center hearings, IHSS hearings, and assessments, and all sorts of things with you as well, as long as our resources allow us to do so. So please feel free to um, reach out to my office if you are with the regional center or, um, or maybe work with regional center families and you need sort of assistance or you want to connect me with someone who could use further assistance. And even if you're not with the regional center, because you are, um, you have a disability or you have, are working with someone with a disability, a loved one maybe with a disability, you can still reach out to me and we could um, uh, direct you to the right place for you to get that assistance and help that you need. And with that, I will go ahead and jump on into the training. And Sonia, I'm seeing messages about um, yeah. having a hard time. Are you able to hear me? I, I can also... hear you. Can uh, Give a thumbs up if you can hear Brittany. Okay. okay. I don't know why your, your mute button is showing that it's on. And mm -hmm. I tried to unmute you, but it didn't work. So I, you... I'm on my cell phone because I get oh. I'm poor sound quality on my computer. Okay. So um, if you, Zabina says she can't hear you. Can everybody else hear? Give a thumbs up, you're good. Okay, we're gonna continue on. We are recording it. So um, Zabina will get the recording out to you later if you're not able to hear it. Okay, go ahead, Brittany, thank you. Great, no problem. I'm going to go ahead and share my, my screen. Uh, oh my gosh, I just did this and I'm not seeing the option to, there we go, okay. All right, and for, for some mysterious reason, when I try to make it full size, it's only showing three of the slides, uh, and then it goes, it says at the end of the presentation, I'll try again to show from the beginning. Yeah, it's just showing partway through. So I'm sorry, it's going to be um, in, in this kind of odd, format right now, uh, but I'm happy to share the PowerPoint with, with Sonia and, and distribute it to everybody else later um, so that everyone can still see the see it in a better format. Sorry, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to see. But the presentation today is going to be about in-home supportive services, or IHSS, which I'm guessing quite a number of people on this call are familiar with. But we'll be going over uh, several different aspects of the IHSS program, eligibility, the assessment process, understanding what the hours are and what the different services that 
within IHSSR and also how to appeal. It is a lot of information for us to try to go through in an hour, but I encourage you to, um, uh, to ask questions in the chat box or unmute at any point so that I can make sure that everything is clear and so that everyone can understand. And okay. again, at the end of the presentation, I'll make sure to share my contact information so that you can reach out to me um, to discuss something more in detail if you need. So I have a uh, observation. Uh, Brittany, um, on your on your computer, you see where you have the big gray bar across the top, and then it says share and comments right there to the top right. You can yes, close yes. you can close that whole thing by pressing the little arrow that shows in the up, and then it'll okay. make sure. Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. Okay, makes it makes it better. Okay, all right. So we'll go ahead and move on. So first, what is IHS? Um, and I'll, I'll read through the slides for the most part until we get a little bit more dense. I know we have, I have some people who are calling and can't see the slides. So first slide, what is IHSS? IHSS is the largest publicly funded non-medical service to help people with disabilities remain in their home. Now, originally, IHSS was designed for uh, people who are elderly, actually, who might uh, have extra needs to just stay safe and healthy in their own home and if they didn't have this extra support they would have to go to a nursing home things like grocery shopping someone to help them with bathing someone to take them to their medical appointment um, those sorts of services are critical to allow them to stay in their community stay in their own home in the least restrictive environment but do so safely and now it's also available to people with disabilities both children and adults um, to go a little bit more in detail about the IHSS services that are available, um, there are domestic services that include cleaning, sweeping, dusting, taking trash out, so on, related services that include meal preparation, meal planning and cleanup, laundry, ironing, putting food items, putting items away, and food shopping. There's personal care services, uh, which is more of the uh, direct care for the person with a disability that includes assistance with feeding, dressing, grooming, bathing, toileting, bowel and bladder, and getting in and out of bed. There's accompaniment services, such as accompaniment to a doctor or to alternative sources of services like a day program. There's paramedical services, which would cover if you need injections or a range of motion exercises, and also protective supervision. And that is a service that is intended to monitor somebody who has a cognitive or mental impairment to keep them safe from any injuries or, or dangerous situations. Um, and these services can be provided to the recipient um, by pretty much anybody who is an adult and allowed to work in the U.S. We'll talk a little bit about the rules for parents and children. But generally, anyone who's adult and allowed to work in the U.S. and the uh, U.S. can be an IHSS provider. Um, so you can imagine the neighbor thing you could have uh, a neighbor or a loved one do for you, hire a woman to the county to do these things for you. A child can have a parent do these things, whether the child a minor or if it's an adult who still wants their uh, parents to take care of them. Um, any of that arrangement is fine with a few uh, rules for parents of minor children. But as you can kind of see, these are all services that are things that all of us need to happen from day to day for our homes to be um, safe and for us to be clean and, and happy and healthy. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how the county goes into deciding how many hours per month you're going to be eligible to get someone to come into your home and help you in these different areas. Can so I... who is eligible for IHSS? I'm sorry, was someone wanting to ask a question? Uh, I actually was going to offer a suggestion if you would like more in-depth information through um, having to um, appeal a decision that was made for my daughter's case, I actually um, was able to acquire the manual um, and policy um, just right before the actual appeal court time. And so you can get that full manual and correlate that with any service provider's um, notes and be able to um, map out the actual qualifications under eligibility for the different guidelines that are there in that manual and policy regulation manual. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the the um, IHSS program is uh, established through the Manual of Policies and Procedures 
and through in that manual, just as uh, I think I was Brenda Garcia who was saying, uh, there are explanations of all the services that exist, all the rules, and it can be definitely very useful if you're looking to appeal or even if you're just wanting to know what services are available, how is this program designed, what's going on here, that it can be a useful resource for that as well. Thank you. Okay, so now we're on this next slide uh, for who is eligible. So if you're a California resident and you're living in your own home um, and you meet one of the following criteria, you can be eligible. So if you're receiving SSI or SSP benefits, that's meaning you're getting um, money from uh, the state or federal government for a, a source of income. Um, so if you're receiving SSI or SSP, or if you meet all the SSI and SSP eligibility criteria, including income, but you're not currently getting it, you can qualify for IHSS services, or if you meet all of the SSI and SSP eligibility criteria, except for income, um, then you might qualify. Um, and that includes those who are regional center clients who qualify for um, the DD waiver um, or the home uh, services waiver. Um, and I think if everyone can make sure you're muted, if you're not uh, trying to unmute to talk, to make sure to mute, so I'm hearing a little bit of background noise. Okay. And then um, the other uh, people who could be eligible for IHSS services are those who are living in a facility um, and want to live on their own um, and can safely live on their own and need to undergo a needs assessment. If you're in that situation, you could qualify for IHSS. For example, if you are someone who uh, has been in the hospital maybe for several weeks or months even um, getting treatment and now you're ready to go home, but you're not able to do so safely yet, you can qualify for IHS services get an assessment and have a set number of hours um, arranged for you before you move out so that you're able to move from the hospital to your own home but do so safely. And we also have this note at the bottom that uh, living in your own home uh, can include uh, being homeless or living in a car. So it doesn't necessarily have to disqualify you from getting IHSS services. Okay, so as I mentioned, the needs assessment on the next slide now, when are needs assessments performed? They're performed when you first apply for services, and then every 12 months after you're found eligible for services, and also whenever the county has information that your mental or physical condition or that your living situation has changed. Um, so I would say you can expect if you or you're um, maybe working with someone who's applying for IHSS, when they first submit that application, they can expect someone to actually come to their home, or right now they actually are doing a lot of these assessments by phone. But typically, you would expect someone to come to your home, talk with you, and at least see the person with a disability and talk to them if that's feasible, and then just get an understanding of the layout of your, of your home. And that will kind of inform what sort of uh, hours services you're eligible for. And then every year after that, after you're found eligible, um, then the county will come out again and reassess, see how your needs have changed in the last year. Is there things you need more help with, less help with? Are people coming into the home now and that changes things? Are people have left the home now and that's changing things? So anything like that, um, that's the information the county would be gathering at that uh, annual reassessment. And then you yourself should say, hey, my needs have changed, can you come out and do a new assessment? I think I need more hours. Um, and that can be appropriate for a bunch of different reasons. Um, sometimes um, individuals with disabilities uh, lose certain skills or have setbacks. Um, there might be new uh, conditions or diagnoses that come up that make everyone aware, okay, this person needs more health areas. Um, people who are uh, maybe even as students are moving out and they're no longer at school for part of the day and now they're wanting to do other activities um, that change just how they need support at home now. Um, those can be certain like, kind of big life changes that happen that might qualify you for an assessment outside of that regular annual assessment. Yeah. All right, so the next slide on assessing need. So the social worker makes an assessment for in-home care in-home in care need using the available medical information, that face-to-face -face home visit I mentioned, 
um, looking at the recipient's physical and mental conditions, their living and social situation, using their time for task guidelines, the recipient's own statement of need, and any other information necessary and appropriate to assess the need. Um, and so some of you might have already experienced this before where the county comes out and they're just trying to get a picture of all of the needs of the person who's applying for the services. And that might include you having letters from your doctor, um, notes from ER visits or discharge reports, anything like that could be very useful for the county to get an understanding of what sort of disability you have and how it affects you and your needs. Um, also during that face-to-face um, -face home visit, they will get an understanding through conversation with either the person with a disability or maybe someone who's there supporting them to get an understanding of what their physical and mental condition is and how that relates to what their needs are. Uh, the living and social situation uh, are also pretty big factors. Um, I think it was in an earlier slide that there was that note about how uh, you can get certain hours for a uh, transfer from moving from one place in the home to another place in the home, like moving from your bed to your uh, Hoyer lift or from your uh, chair on the, on the, at the kitchen table to the couch over there, that there yes. might be some help that you need. And uh, you can imagine if you live in a two-story home, you might need more help than if you live in a one-story home, because now you have stairs that are a factor. Um, or perhaps just the layout of the home and how the distance between things, that can be a factor as well in trying to figure out how many hours a person needs. So that's part of what the social worker would be looking at when they're doing that face-to-face um, -face home visit. And also the time for task guidelines. Now that's something that each county has created. Um, for example, I think for, uh, uh, for bathing, you usually will get 20 minutes if you need um, some assistance with bathing, usually the max would be 20 minutes. But as we know, people with disabilities have varying needs, and sometimes 20 minutes is just not going to be enough. If you right. have, um, I've had clients who have- Two hours. Um, okay, so I heard someone say two hours. So that could absolutely be the case, that if you're working with someone who um, has sensory needs and that water or the soap or whatever is gonna put them off or they're or not going to be able to really engage in the process, um, if there's uh, could be a myriad of things that are could be uh -huh. happening that cause someone to need a lot more time. So uh -huh. um, even with counties using that time for test guidelines, and it is just a guideline. There are exceptions for every every type of service that needs. There could be an exception there. Um, so just keep in mind that when they're doing that assessment, that's the framework that they have, and so you want to make sure that you're giving them lots of information about how you're actually supporting the person with a disability or if it's you're getting hours for yourself, how you need to be supported um, so that you're able to be healthy and safe. Um, yeah, non-ambulatory. Okay, yeah, for someone who's non-ambulatory, you can imagine that they're not able to engage in a lot of the aspects of daily living tasks, and so it's going to require a lot more time than some maybe you just have to do a reminder or just maybe some physical guiding to go to task to task. If you have to do completely everything for them, you would need more time for that. Did I hear right. someone else, like someone else wanting to speak up? Um, yeah, um, there's a question in the chat box. Um, will IHSS make exceptions for in-home given restrictions due to COVID-19? Um, a couple of folks have said that they've been told everything is on hold until the last in-home visit, um, until that in-home visit can occur, um, but they can't schedule it due to the COVID. Mm -hmm. Well, the county is considered essential workers. So if you need an assessment, then they still have to, if you need a new assessment or if you're applying for services, that is not on hold. They do still need to be working. Um, and I would very much encourage you to give me a call if they're telling you, oh, sorry, you're just going to have to wait because we're not doing any assessments or we're not uh, changing anyone's hours. That is not correct. They are absolutely still working. They are essential, and these are essential services that people need literally to survive. Um, so that's not correct. They do. They there are some exceptions that are in place right now. Um, for example, they usually the, the assessments are in person. Now they're allowing those to happen over the phone. There are rules about parent providers that parents have lost their jobs and now there's uh, it would kind of throw into question whether the second parent could be a provider anymore. Um, there is an exception now 
which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, so that parents can still be providers. So there are exceptions here and there, but but they still absolutely need to be um, working and doing assessments and adjusting hours as needed. Yeah, and so in light of that, um, <clears throat> you're, when you have the worker come in, also I've had people say that they had a 20 minute visits with the social worker. They just come in and sit down. So it's your job as the advocate for your client or if you're the parent, um, well, actually, if you're the provider, you can't really advocate. You have to leave it up to the parents. But in my instance, I'm the one that's advocating. So I make that worker stay the maximum amount of time and I go through everything line by line um, in there and I, I have the rankings of my child um, ready and I'm ready to debate with them with the information that I have from all of the service providers, um, whether it be Alta or the school nurse or um, the, the day programs notes. Um, you have to bring all of that to the table to get them the biggest picture possible to be able to validate the need because otherwise they'll just stick them in a ranking but they're not getting the details and the specifics they think it's a 20 minute bath and no and yes transfers putting on putting on afos taking off afos all of the equipment uh it's safety it's for safety so that manual would really help anyone um that's that's not getting the services currently be able to get an you know in-depth perspective of what their child is or their client is in need of so yeah that's just wanted to share that okay and then we will have some resources towards the end that can also be useful for people who are trying to prepare um, for their their assessments it can be a very intimidating process um, and I did also have a comment about uh, social workers coming in for just 20 minutes I've heard that for years that's not even something special or new you know because of COVID-19 that's unfortunately something that I have certainly had reported to me many times. Social worker came in for 20 minutes and they only saw my child who was asleep, so they didn't even get to understand what it's like day in and day out. Like they don't get it and can't see it. It's like a 20 minute picture. And really, even if they're there for like an hour, um, they're still not going to get necessarily that whole understanding of what goes into taking care of a person with a disability. So I definitely agree with you want to have the, any notes from the regional center, if you're a regional center client or, or with the regional center at all, um, from the school, that's really useful. If there's anything else from the medical file that you want to have with you, um, if they're getting SSI benefits, you have an, a social security evaluation, anything like that is going to be really useful so that the social worker can um, get a, as big a picture, like you said, uh, uh, as big a picture as possible of what the, what the person's needs are and then hopefully assess them so that it actually captures what the need is. And we'll talk about rankings, I think, in the next couple of slides to say more about how the county goes into that. Um, are there any other questions on this part or comments on this part so far? No, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, advocacy tips. So for the needs assessment, to prepare for the new assessment or annual reassessment, we would encourage you to complete our IHSS self-assessment worksheet, which I think there's a link to at the at the end of the uh, presentation. Um, but that can be useful just for to help you outline what it is that you're doing um, for the person or if you yourself have a disability, what you need help with um, when you're at home to stay uh, safe and healthy. Uh, this worksheet, worksheet can be found in Appendix A of our publication, IHSS Nuts and Bolts, or in our IHSS Fair Hearing and Self-Assessment Packet. And do this before the in-home assessment, not while you're um, while you're just not in the middle of the assessment and i really i would want to say that uh i get dozens and dozens of calls about ihss um all the time um every month there's, there's so many questions about ihss and what i see across the board is that uh especially parents really under report what they're doing um they are just i think used to just making sure their child needs are being taken care of and just going in day after day after day for years at a time just making sure the child's needs are met. So when the social worker says, okay, how long do you spend with bathing? They'll be like, I don't know, um, maybe maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I, I don't know, it, it, it just changes. And that can be a sort of a dangerous thing because the social worker might then 
go on the lower end of that or you're really not telling the full picture and then in the end you don't get all the hours that you need. So I really encourage you to take that time to go through all of in this, um, the test of worksheet that's referenced here to go through every category, see exactly what all of the areas that this person with a disability might qualify for services in, and then you track yourself for like a week or two weeks ideally, time yourself because I guarantee you're spending more time in these areas than you think you are. And if you can at the assessment show the social worker, here's here, I tracked my time during doing all of these activities for two weeks. That should answer all your questions. That can be really, really powerful um, in the assessment. And if you get the point of an appeal, it could be very powerful there um, to just have that laid out record of how much time is going into making sure that the person with the disability is being taken care of. Okay, and then how how uh, services are authorized. Well, sort of just summarize this. I referenced a little bit earlier, but for every uh, task that exists, whether it's bathing, um, meal prep, meal cleanup, feeding, repositioning, dressing, transfers, whatever the case may be, there's already a guideline for how much time a person can get in those different areas. So that's what the social worker is kind of has in mind as they're doing having the conversation with the person during the needs assessment. Um, the social worker um, must document all the tasks that require more or less time than is laid out in the guidelines and any reason that there needs to be an increase in any area or a decrease in any area. And again, the last bullet point, keep the log of your daily care needs so you can explain why you need more time so really can't emphasize that enough. If you just do your best to try to guesstimate, I'm really confident that you will guesstimate on the low end. You won't, you won't really say exactly what is needed, and as a result, you might end up not getting authorized as many hours as you actually need um, to be safe. Um, and then I think the, yes, okay, so we're about to go, go into ranking, so that word's come up a few times now. So this is how services are authorized. The rankings are part of the assessment um, that the county uses to decide what your ability is to do certain tasks. And there's a range from one to six for each task. And so as we were talking about the bathing, the toileting, feeding, each of those areas, the county is assigning a number between one and six, and that number correlates with how many minutes you get, how many at the end of the day, how many hours you're going to get for the full month. So here are the, here's the rankings in an explanation. So a ranking of one means that your functioning is independent, and you can perform the function without human assistance, um, and that you might have difficulty in performing the function, but you can complete the function with or without um, a device or, or mobility. There's no big risk to your safety. And a, you'll also get a ranking of one if it's something that the person's not eligible to get based on their age, uh, like um, laundry for a two-year-old. Two-year-olds do not do laundry, so all two-year-olds will get a one, and that doesn't mean it's because your two-year-old is great at doing their, their own laundry. It just means they don't qualify because it's something that you wouldn't expect that person to do, regardless of a disability. You wouldn't expect them to do that. So you might see that for some uh, for minors, that there are certain areas that they will get a one, and that means that it's expected that the, uh, that the parent or the legal guardian is performing those tasks because of their age only, nothing to do with their disability. So that's a ranking of one. Then we have a ranking of two. That means you can do the function, but you need some verbal assistance, like a remind, reminding, guidance, or encouragement. A ranking of three means you need a kind of a mixture of a little bit of physical assistance now. Um, could include direct physical assistance from a, from a provider, maybe like kind of physically guiding someone from one task to another. Um, a ranking of four means you can perform the function, but only with substantial human assistance. A ranking of five means you cannot do the function at all with or without human assistance. You cannot do it at all. And a ranking of six means you need uh, paramedical services for that task. Um, and I would say for, for number five, ranking of five, someone mentioned before, non-ambulatory. And, um, you know, meaning that the person is not able to, to move independently. They need someone to move them or parts of their body for them, their arms and legs um, for them. So. You can imagine someone with a, who is non-ambulatory is going to need have a ranking of five in areas like ambulation, um, transfers. It could be things like um, meal prep. If you don't have use of your, of your arms and legs, you're not going to be able to do that at all. You'll need someone to just do those sorts of things for you. 
Um, but keep that in mind. This is what the county was there asking you. Okay, so you said you have to help your child with bathing. So what does that look like? And if you're like, well, I have to just keep doing reminders, um, you know, to uh, use soap and don't forget to wash up your arms, you know, then that's going to be a ranking of, you know, probably a two. Whereas if you say, I have to actually wash their hair for them and scrub them down, then that might be something that's a three or a four um, or possibly a five. So just keep in mind that when you're explaining how you're trying to make sure the person with the disability is, uh, is getting their needs met, go into extreme graphic detail, I would actually say about exactly what you're doing with toileting. This is not the time to be to be shy. Um, you know, you want to be very much very upfront with all the care the person needs. And uh, depending on the person with the disability, um, it might make sense to have part of the assessment, most of the assessment happen when they're not there. Because some of these things can be embarrassing or, or uncomfortable and they might think they can do certain things that they maybe really can't or might just may not make them feel good to talk about their menstrual cycle with a complete stranger um, while they're sitting there. You know, it just, it just depends. So kind of keep that in mind as well, just to have a productive assessment and make sure that you're able to get all the information you need. You might say, hey, why don't you go to your room? We're, we're going to go ahead and keep this meeting going, but you can just go ahead and, and go do something else that's fun. You don't need to sit here for it so that you have the opportunity as the advocate or the parent to be able to help make sure that the meeting is moving forward in a productive way and with the hope that if you have a really good assessment, you don't have to worry about an appeal because you end up getting the hours that you need from that from that initial meeting. Right. Um, if I might add something to that, yes. um, there was um, a family member, they are paralyzed from the waist down, so they can't move, but they are female, so they didn't want to address that. They're like, yeah, I can do that on my own. I can do that on my own. And the social worker, the worker in the home um, doing the evaluation for this individual was asking her specifically, can you do this? And she says, yeah. And the mom is like, no. So when you're doing those evaluations, um, you have to let the person that's seeking the IHSS service know that this is for their own benefit to be able to compensate for the amount of work that that family member is doing. They have to respect that. And that's a whole respect thing, but it's it's very involved. And yes, it might be seem embarrassing, but it's something that everybody does. And you have to break down those barriers of, um, oh, this is a taboo thing, because it's, it's not. It's everybody has has to go to the bathroom or has to be cleaned in some way and so you you have to let that client or that recipient know that you know in order for you to get the services that you need and they're compensated the family member that's compensated or the person that comes into the home to provide these services for you is compensated you have to be um very open and not be not act like it's a taboo thing. It's just like a doc. You have to regard it as a doctor's visit in some ways because yes, it's way more involved than what you're typically comfortable with doing. But they also have to understand that those workers are mandated. Um, it's all private. They're also mandated reporters, but it's also private. I forgot the name of it, but yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, thank you. Definitely, you want to make sure that you're. Being as open as you can and as detailed as you can with again the hope that you'll end up getting the hours you actually need and you don't have to go through this drawn out appeal process because you got what you needed from the very beginning definitely okay then we have um this uh slide again just giving some advice about preparing for an assessment um read disability rights california's ihss assessment packet fill out the self-assessment worksheet. Always try to have, a, and, and this is kind of more directed, if we're talking to a person with a disability who's advocating for themselves, but always try to have a friend or family member or someone else there to participate in the assessment um, and lean towards asking for services on the days that you need the most help, not so much on the days when you're the most independent or someone's having a really good day and they're being very compliant and agreeable and cooperative you don't want to necessarily spend really any time talking about that part talk about when it's hard because that's when you need the the hours the most okay and then to get into protective supervision um 
this is a service for people who have a cognitive or mental impairment, and they require 24 hours, seven day a week observation to safeguard themselves against injury or hazard or accident. Um, let me stop right there. Like, so this is a very, very highly um, disputed area. And I think part of the reason it's so highly disputed is the way the hours are packaged. Um, you get uh, up to 195 hours for protective supervision per month. Uh, so it's something that, in my experience, the county is always so eager to authorize. Um, and so you really want to make sure that you're emphasizing how this person is a danger to themselves um, because they just lack this understanding of how their, um, their actions could harm themselves. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides. Um, and protective supervision, just to get this out of the way, it's not available for friendly visits or social activities. It's not available for when the need for supervision is caused by a medical condition and the supervision required is medical. It's not available for anticipation of a medical emergency. And it's not available to prevent or control antisocial or aggressive behavior or suicidal behavior. Um, it could be that this person needs supervision for these reasons as well, but th these reasons in themselves will not qualify you for protective supervision. So I often will tell parents, do not spend a lot of time talking about how you need to supervise your child with autism because he bites and kicks and pinches his sister. Um, that's not going to get you protective supervision, although that's happening. What I want you to be talking about is how they try to play with the stove, they try to run away from the house, they climb up on furniture and try to jump off, they put on food items in their mouth, that how they're a danger to themselves, not about how they're aggressive towards others. That's a very, very big one that we get a lot of calls and questions about. So keep in mind those areas that you cannot get protective supervision for. Yeah. And as I mentioned, supervision, protective supervision is authorized in um, giant blocks of time. If you're considered a non-severely impaired individual, you would get 195 hours, um, and that would be the max you could get, including protective supervision. If you're considered a severely impaired individual, the max you can get is 283 hours, and within that, there's that 195 hours for protective supervision. Um, will I hear your comments or questions? Yeah, and it's also not available for, I prepared the scenario, my daughter can cough and aspirate, choke on her saliva and aspirate. Well, that's done, that doesn't qualify because she's not ambulatory. For those, it's more for those that are ambulatory, more for those that are aware, like if they pick up a knife, they can. They don't know what to do. They don't know that it's unsafe. They don't know that cars, if they hit them, they'll just run in the street. Yeah, that's what it's for, but it's not for non-ambulatory people who have, you know, over over too much secretions and they can potentially choke and aspirate or the other thing happen. So I've discovered that as well. Yeah, and I, I would say um, the examples I gave are examples of things that would happen for someone who does have um, those growth on skills to do those things, but also it could be that I've had clients who are uh, who are in a bed and aren't able to get out without substantial assistance and who have, say, uh, uh, different types of medical equipment that are attached to their, their bodies and because they lack awareness and understanding, they might try to pull things off of their body and that could cause harm. And I've had clients who are eligible for protective supervision because of that, because they'll try to remove uh, the tubes in their in their nose or, or throat and you need to wash them all the time to prevent them and they actually qualify even though they're they don't appear to be they you know they're not as active maybe as other individuals might be but because they do have that mental impairment they do need to be washed all the time because they're doing things that are a danger to themselves that they can't understand they can actually qualify so it's very much a, you know case by case basis and the example of you know aspirating and needing to wash them because they could be in a harm's way because of that. That falls under that they have a medical condition and you have to wash them for like kind of a medical need to make sure you're administering emergency medical treatment. Um, you're not going to qualify for protective supervision for something like that. And so a little more on protective supervision um, and uh, how you can get from those 283 hours to 195 hours. If you have um, 20 hours or more in one of these essential service categories per week, um, then you're considered a severely impaired individual. And just to uh, run through them really quick, if you have 20 hours or more in any 
any uh, 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 if uh, the, altogether these in these services do amount to 20 or more, that's enough. It's not like you have 20 hours in one individual area. But if any combination of meal preparation, respiration, uh, feeding, bed bath, dressing, menstrual care, ambulation, transfers in and out of bed, grooming, rubbing skin, health, skin, help with uh, prosthesis and paramedical services, if any combination of those services amounts to 20 hours or more a week, then you're considered a severely impaired individual, and you can your maximum number of hours per month jumps up to 283. So sometimes for those advocates out there or family members themselves out there, take a look at how close um, the recipient is to that 20 hours, because sometimes it's worth it to advocate for a few more minutes here with ambulation or a few more minutes here with respiration if that's going to get you to 20 hours, and then now your max jumps up and your hours will jump up pretty significantly. So just something to keep in mind as you're reviewing your, your notice. You might want to pay careful attention there because there could be a big increase for you um, in that way. Hey, Brittany, could I interrupt for a second? Um, this is Kathy Bryan, and Danielle Kenworthy has a question she'd like to ask. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Um, Brittany, thank you. Um, I provide IHSS to my son who, I, I posted this on the chat, but I'd like to ask it during the protective supervision time. I provide IHSS to my son who's 25, who has been assessed to um, have severe needs, and formerly he got 283 hours a month. Um, my husband now provides IHSS to my mother-in-law who has been assessed to need um, protective supervision and originally they said you know she would receive the maximum but the county that we're in says that they can be watched in common according to the letter the all county letter they um, cut back on their protective supervision hours because of that letter and i'm just wondering is is that uh uh what i want to say is that hard and fast or is this just a call by the county that you know is this always how this all county letter is interpreted or is this kind of you know somebody's idea of how it's interpreted because it doesn't seem right we cannot we cannot watch them in common we cannot watch them in the same room as a matter of fact my mother-in-law really doesn't want to be with my son in the same room doing the things that he does and we um, my son is uh, you know, he, he aspirates on food and my mother-in-law would like to feed him at times. And so we, we really try to keep them separated. Their interests are different, but the county cool. says, you know, this is what the all county letter says. <laughs> I would ask for a supervisor in regards to that. I always ask for so, a supervisor. <laughs> so I, if you want to talk about your specific case and kind of the details about the behaviors and things, you could definitely do that. I'd really encourage you, Donnell, to, to give me a call so we can talk more about that. And just to kind of address the, the just so everyone knows about proration, um, that yeah. is something the county has to consider. If there's two or more recipients, IHS recipients living in the same home, if the task that they need a special care for can be handled at the same time, the county is supposed to reduce it accordingly. So some people here might even have, you know, two or more recipients or multiple kids or whatever the case may be in the home and might see that their hours are being reduced because the county thinks both of these two or more recipients can have their needs met at the same time. It does not have to be that way if, like in your situation, it doesn't work like that. It's not like one person can be at the home making sure both recipients are being supervised appropriately at the same time. Sometimes that's not possible. So for that, I would actually say to file an appeal um, when you get, I don't know, within the timeline to file an appeal, but for everybody, you get that notice and you see that your hours are reduced, they're saying it's a proration issue, you have to file an appeal, and then a judge would have the power to overturn um, that decision and say, no, both of these people have specialized needs that cannot be met at the same time or by the same provider. So the year hours need to be need to reflect that, so the family can then hire, you know, two separate providers, and both um, adults in the home can provide that care to the two people at the same time as needed. So, uh, so a very good question. Preparation is something that can be very difficult and become very complicated, but it's not something that is if you have two recipients in the home, then everything is halved all the time, 
no questions, you know, no questions, you know, anything else after that is like, no, you can actually appeal and then um, bring, present that case to the judge and say, this isn't adequate and I want you to overturn the decision for the Thank you. No problem. Again, feel free to please give me a call back if you want to talk more one-on-one -on -one, um, about your situation. Thank you. I'm kind of keeping an eye on the time as well as 12.51, so we'll try to go through a little bit more, but please definitely keep, feel free to keep asking questions as we go through. Oh. Um, paramedical services. Um, so this is something that is another uh, IHS service that is, provide, is ordered by a licensed healthcare professional and provided under the direction of a licensed professional. And these are services that um, a person would normally do for themselves, but they can't because of their disability. And some examples of paramedical services would be administering medication, injections, um, range of motion exercises, inserting a catheter, things like that um, are something that an IHS worker could be trained by the doctor to perform for the person with the disability. You do need to fill out a, have the doctor fill out a form expressing what the care is that the person needs, um, how much time these certain tasks take and, and, and that such thing. I think the, the form, yeah, the forms at the top, um, SOC 321, uh, that's the form that you would have to have the doctor fill out and the doctor could give it to you or, or send it to the social worker and then your hours um, for paramedical services should be um, decided uh, as, the, as decided by the, as the recommended by the doctor. Some doctors don't really know how these forms work. They might say this is going to take 400 hours a month or something, and that's just not possible within uh, with how the county operates because the max that anyone ever could get is 283 hours. So um, something to keep in mind what the doctor says doesn't necessarily just go, but that it is critical to have the doctor say this person needs this type of help, takes about this amount of time, and the county should consider that and then authorize paramedical services accordingly. Any questions on that one? Okay. okay, so then to get into, can a parent be a paid IHSS provider um, for their minor child? So the parent can be the IHSS provider for a minor child if the parent quit their job or can't work full time because they have to care for their uh, disabled child and if there's no other suitable care provider available and if a child is at risk of an out-of-home placement or inadequate, or inadequate care, um, and if both parents live at home, one parent can be the paid provider while the other parent is working or in school, or if they have a disability themselves that prevents them from being able to be, provide these type of care to the child. So it can get very complicated um, with parent providers um, be, because of the way the rule is, is designed. So if you have questions about this, I encourage you to give me a call so we can talk about whatever that specific situation is. But in short, if a parent is prevented from finding a full-time job or keeping a full-time job because of their child's special needs, then they can be quali can qualify as um, an IHSS provider. And if they're in a two-parent home, then they cannot get, our, get paid for the time while the other parent is able and available. Um, to provide that care. Uh, so it can start to get a little bit complicated and one of the exceptions or uh, one of the changes that came out recently during the COVID-19 uh, shelter in place order um, is that you know, lots of people lost their jobs and aren't able to work their full 40 hours a week anymore. So the state said for now, just don't worry about it. If you lost your job or you got furloughed uh, related to these uh, COVID-19, don't worry about it. We're not gonna bother checking on anybody's hours until July 1st. Uh, it could be extended, um, but for now, that's just something that no one has to, to worry about. But generally, if a, if a parent, if both parents are not working, then neither parent could be the IHS provider because at all times, the other parent is able and available. So you can't be the IHS provider because you're both kind of canceling each other out. So it can get a little bit confusing, but feel free to reach out to us if you have questions about um, the parent provider rules. Brittany, I'm going to um, interest here just for a minute. We have five minutes, and 
I think if, if everyone's fine and wants to, because we want to get through to the end, we can certainly go um, five or 10 minutes into one o'clock. Um, but I'd like to launch the poll right now. Um, so if we could just take a minute and then, and then we'll let you continue for sure. So um, there's going to be a poll that shows up on your screen. Um, let me know if you see it. Can you see that? Okay, so go ahead and answer. You satisfied so far, realizing that we're not done and also that we're doing probably what should be a four hour training in one hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll give it a few more seconds. All right, 19 of you completed it. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling. Um, gonna share the results. <coughs> okay, and um, now this is, I don't know how to do this. I've never been, figured out how to get to my second question. Um, so that's the question. I wanna let you get back, um, back to, your presentation. Go ahead, Brittany. Okay, thanks, Sonia. Yeah. Um, and let me just skip really quick to the end, just in case there is anyone who has to leave. This is project the phone number. So feel free to give to give me a call uh, at this number, the 916-504-5833. Again, that's 916-504-5833. If you're um, with the regional center and you want to reach out to us, I'd encourage you to give us a call at that number. We can talk more about any questions you have. And also, um, there's a number for the general uh, legal help intake line for Disability Rights California. That's 1-800-776-5746. If you're not with the regional center and you're still wanting some assistance, you can, you can still give me a call and I can at least direct you to the right place. But um, this is the, the right number to call if you're not with the regional center and you're wanting some sort of legal assistance. Okay. All right, so we went through the parent provider rule. So uh, as far as applying, um, if you're interested in applying for IHSS, you should call your local county office to apply. And this is all kind of theoretical. So I'll say how it should go and say the few issues I've seen before, but the social worker should make an appointment to meet with you in your home, talk about your condition, your living arrangement, your social arrangement, um, what sort of help you're getting from family and friends and other people. The social worker should be asking how often um, the person with a disability needs different types of help. You might need to fill out a form. Um, you will have to fill out a form with the doctor when you first apply to say that you have a disability and, and you need extra assistance to be safe at home. And the social worker will then send a notice of action, either letting you know that you were approved and here's how many hours you're approved for or that you were denied. And in either case, you can appeal if you disagree with the denial or you disagree with the amount of hours that they uh, are authorizing. Um, I do have families who report they call the county and they're like, I want to apply for my eight-year-old with special needs. And the county's like, what are you talking about? You're a parent. This is your job. Don't call me back. And then, you know, pretty much hangs up on you. And that's, that's really incorrect. Um, if you have, uh, you have a disability, you may be eligible for services and they need to at least do the application. It could be at the end of the day, they still deny you because after doing the assessment, they don't think you actually qualify for any help based on a combination of things. Maybe it's your disability, maybe it's the way your age. And so they're like, oh yeah, you're 12 months old. Like you're not able to do anything regardless of your disability. So your parents should still be doing this, you know, deny for that reason. Like that could be the case, but they really need to be processing your application doing the assessment and then issuing the notice of action, letting you know the final decision. So I encourage you and encourage families, insist, insist that they come out, insist that they accept your application. They never should just deny your application over the phone at all. But unfortunately, that's something that I do hear happening, um, unfortunately, fairly regularly, actually. So I just wanna make sure that's very, very clear. They should accept your application and process it, even if in the end they issue you a notice denying your eligibility. Which you can appeal. Which you can appeal, yes. And speaking of which you can appeal, um, this is the slide on notice of action. So that is 
something that is absolutely required, whether your application is approved or denied. And it also should be sent anytime your services are altered or discontinued in any way or reduced. So what, nothing should change without you knowing about it by this notice. Um, when you are, uh, you have to have a notice of approving or denying your application within 30 days of you initially applying for the services. And they should send you a notice of your uh, termination, uh, a termination of benefits or, uh, or excuse me, termination of services or reduction in services at least 10 days before the reduction is actually going to take place. Um, and when, no matter what notice you get, you always have the right to appeal it and you have 90 days to appeal um, that that notice of action. Um, and I should add, uh, what's the next slide, APA pending? Yeah. Okay, so you have, um, you should request that hearing and file that appeal as soon as possible. No matter what, I would say just file an appeal if you look at it and you're not happy with it, even if you're not sure what's going on, just appeal. Just do it quickly so you don't end up losing, um, losing out on your option to appeal because the deadline passes. There's information on the back of each notice about how to appeal. You can call the uh, state hearings division with the state and do an appeal. It takes about three or four minutes maybe to do it by phone, or you can fill out the appeal form on the back and mail it in. Either way is fine. I've never really had a problem with someone saying they mailed it in and it wasn't processed. So it seems to be pretty fine, although I like to call in just so I can talk to somebody and know for sure it got, or it got in or you can do both. Um, if someone's going to be, if it's for an adult who has um, IHSS services, then uh, they could ask someone to represent them through the hearing process for children. Their parents can represent them through the hearing process. Um, or if you want to hire an advocate or an attorney, they can become the authorized representative and uh, go through the hearing process on your behalf. And I do want to, I know we're closing on, on the end, but um, I do want to mention APA pending. So APA pending is a very, very important thing. Essentially, it means that if the county reduces your hours, if you file um, within 10 days of getting that notice of action, you get to keep your hours the same throughout the hearing process. And as you can imagine, that can be very, very important. If you were getting 200 hours a month and then suddenly they reduce it, they're like, we don't need to protect supervision anymore, and it's down to like five. Um, you know, that could be catastrophic because suddenly you're not going to have anyone there doing supervising you to stay safe, or if that's the family's main source of income to care for their children with special needs, suddenly your income is blown. And so you just really want to keep in mind a pay pending is a very important right to just file within 10 days of getting that notice of action, and then you get to keep those services um, throughout the appeal process, which can take which can take months. So that's a long time to go without the care that you need. So always, I would say, if you're not happy with it, just file an appeal. You can easily withdraw later on and say, never mind. And it's not it's not a big deal to withdraw it, but if you miss the deadline, you're stuck. And um, you will not get another chance unless you are you can make an argument that suddenly your needs have changed and you need to do a new assessment, get a new notice, or you just wait till next year for another assessment, which, of course, is an even longer time to go without without services. So appeal, appeal, appeal. If there's anything that you disagree with, just file the appeal to be safe, and then you're able to kind of do your do your own research, re use your own resources, contact me or someone else, and then know if you want to move forward with it. But just be very cautious because these deadlines are not flexible. Um, and then uh, just to have this is out all of the timelines for APA pending. Make sure you're filing before the effective date of the proposed action, 10 days. You have to request a hearing within 90 days if you want to appeal at all, regardless of APA pending. You have 90 days to file for a hearing period. Um, notice of hearing, they have to send you a notice of the hearing date and uh, uh, date, time, and location at least 10 days before the hearing. Uh, the county will draft what's called a position statement um, in preparation for your hearing, which just explains what the hours are and why they decided how many hours you should get um, or why you didn't qualify for certain things so the county has to make that available to two businesses for the hearing um, you should get a decision nine days from the date of your hearing request and then if you get your hearing decision back and you disagree with it you have 30 days from getting the decision to request for rehearing which basically like if you over you're just like i think the judge just what is wrong or did something wrong and deciding my case so I want to have a, a second chance. 
and then if you want to um, you also have the right to file an appeal uh, and file a writ with the superior court one year from the date of the hearing decision if you disagree with it so just to make it in mind that there's a lot of there's a lot of deadlines in here but uh, it's good to try to keep track of all of these things as you're going through um, possibly going through an appeal process so you just know what to expect and when and then the last slide has our resource yes Oh, Brittany, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Katari sure. has a question. Okay. Maybe she'd like me to ask it. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> sorry, Katari. Where, where's the mute button? Okay. So I have a question. If you're at, let's say, your one year mark where um, you're supposed to um, either be renewed, you're supposed to have that assessment again or that mm -hmm. home visit. And you haven't received that or a telephone call or notice of action or anything like who do you follow through with um so if that you, you're if I, i'm sorry sorry you're saying if you're if it's time for the annual assessment and just no one's contacted you yes uh i would say the social worker um to ask what's just what's going on are you going to be coming out what's happening um, the social worker would be my, my first person to go to. I've also sometimes just called the county office because social workers are out in the field a lot. They have cases right. like 500 people. So I don't always have the best luck getting a hold of the social worker. But if you call the county office, um, that can be at least a way to talk to a human and see if there was something that was missed. They send a yes, that's the address, nice something like that. That okay, would be so. the next time I would try. Just try the county office. Um, and you could also ask them to connect you to your social worker supervisor if you're just not having Anyone. I'm not having any luck reaching her or anyone else for that matter, but um, yeah. yeah. Um, I would try to count, try the county because they'll at least answer the phone and it'll be a human and then if you can, they'll just connect you to the supervisor and uh, and just leave voicemail messages and if you can get an email, I like email, so obviously you can I do prove too. that you're trying. Okay, yeah. email is good, but <laughs> I know that sometimes it's not so responsive. So that would be my best, my best okay. recommendation is try that. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I have a question. Is I'm not sure if I'm the one that's supposed to be talking or not. Um, it's Karen Mulvaney. Um, I have a question about the um, grocery shopping aspect of IHSS assessment. Um, in our COVID environment, um, we uh, decided to shut down um, community outings. Um, when uh, the pandemic was, um, you know, first um, cited by um, the World Health Organization, and uh, my understanding is that IHSS hours can't um, accrue to activities if they don't take place in the presence of the IHSS recipient. Um, so, what would your advice be on that issue? We we cannot use CalFresh in our county anywhere for online ordering of service of, of food. Um, so the only way to obtain food using her CalFresh benefits is to go in person to a grocery store, which you know obviously is dangerous for lots of people with um, IDD. I don't know if I quite understand your question, but maybe um Maybe said that's really specific to you. We should be looking at it one almost one ten. Maybe we can talk more one on one about that. Okay. Um, for for example, when I was going getting the prune juice for my daughter, I I had to specifically state that it's not in the same location as the place that I go shopping for my regular food, and um, I wasn't taking her with me. Um, so it's it was still taken into consideration and that was during the appeals process that you can go pick up the prescription you physically obviously the client does not have to go with you for that exercise because you're still providing that service even if you're get you're going out into the community to get it and then bring it back so it still qualifies under that but you have to actually go do it I don't have a problem going out shopping. I use a mechanical cleaning mechanism, not a chemical cleaning. So, and it's FDA approved. So I just utilize that. I don't have an issue going in public. Any other questions?
Okay. Um, okay actually, I do have a question, Brittany. Um, can you, t I read something about unmet needs are supposed to be um, quantified and assessed in your IHSS assessment and that we're looking at 7%, um, a 7% cut in IHSS hours um, and that uh, to the extent that there are unmet needs in your assessment, you can um, keep your hours where they are and not um, sustain that 7% cut. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Uh, no, I'm not, sorry, I'm not aware of, of that. Okay. Um, I'm with the SEIU um, union um, for helping the care providers. I kind of help advocate for people to keep their things, their hours in place and intact. Um, we had a call with the county in regards, it's, it's county by county too. So um, it depends by on the county, obviously with the state as well, but um, you have to vocalize and advocate that as care providers still being um, essential workers, yes, they're trying to take that away, but if enough people vocalize that this is not adequate because we are actually helping to keep this population, the most fra fragile and vulnerable people in our, pop in our community, that population from being having issues and going to the emergency rooms. Um, and having to take on that aspect of um, the potential for that population in the community. So um, it's it's just comes down to advocating within your community to avoid that. Brenna, that's such a good point of sh showing up and advocating and getting involved in boards and that's what we encourage everyone to do it's you can be one voice and make a huge difference when you're a parent uh, or individual who receives services um, just one voice makes a huge difference so we um, always try to share opportunities to get involved and mm -hmm. being involved in the IHSS boards is, is really important um, so I would just like to give a big big thank you to Brittany for her time and Great. her Great. knowledge Great. and um, and just being here for all of us and answering uh, questions. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the call. Mm -hmm. Brittany, I hope that you will continue to be available to us um, mm -hmm. on maybe a wide, wider variety of, of topics and, um, and continue to come back and, and uh, share your wisdom with us. So thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, no problem. Thank you for yeah, Absolutely. Okay, we're going to go ahead and end the call again. We, it was recorded, so um, we will share out the recording soon. There's a couple of people who joined late and are looking forward to having that recording. Everyone is waving and saying thank you, Brittany. So everyone have a safe and good day, and we will be in touch soon about other meetings and efforts. So thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.